12th verse spoke about how the rakshasas and asuras lead a life of extraversion vain hopes all their life they are driven with vain desires they perform vain actions they live in the imaginary realm of what the future might offer they never lead in fact they lead a purposeless life hoping in vain and the 13th verse said the mahatmas they worship because being possessed of the divine nature they worship me with unwavering mind having known me to be the imperishable source of beings and in the 14th verse satatam kirtayanto maam yatantascha drudhavrataha always glorifying me satatam kirtayanta striving drudhavrataha firm in vows striving so while you are striving striving means while you are acting while your actions are being performed with action and exertion the the thought is towards the towards the self as he says always glorifying me so when an action is performed with an objective to attain or unite something higher it becomes yogic in nature so when an action is oblated for a higher purpose it becomes yoga so when i engage action as a means to unite to the self it is known as karma yoga karma is action as he says striving satatam always you are performing actions refers to karma yoga always striving you are putting an effort at the physical level but that actions are for the self he says glorifying mom the self me so when an action is towards the higher it becomes karma yoga but the same action devoid of a goal becomes selfish becomes self aggrandizing it's non yogic so the the terms striving glorifying firm in vows refers to karma yoga so anything you do you do it only in the interest of a larger cause whatever you do i have enough light on my head but i was concerned that there is no light for you all that's why i said put on r2 r3 not for me for you all that thought has to be there that is bothering me when lights are there not switched on why should you sit in the dark somebody puts in effort to write the row number so you just have to switch it on so that there is light it's not i am so comfortably sitting in light and you are sitting in darkness how can that be so whatever you do is you you do it in the in the interest of others that's when it becomes karma yoga the opposite is you do it at the expense of others when i do something i i don't mind others loss so my benefit at the cost of others at the expense of others when that thought exists when that thought consumes you you are non yogic your actions are in fact that's the that's the definition of a worldly action an action which doesn't the switch on for me uh irunga irunga 
the action which you do without embracing the interest of a larger purpose that such actions become materialistic such actions are non spiritual but the moment it embraces a larger interest and the largest interest you can embrace is for huh? ah when you perform the action of all actions actions driven towards self realization are the highest actions so i can perform an action for my benefit i can perform action for your benefit for the benefit of society for the benefit of humanity they're all grades of actions but the highest of actions i perform whatever i do if i'm doing for self realization that is unparalleled that is the highest of karma yoga it may be perceived as the most selfish act but it's the most selfless act so anything you do for self realization is the highest goal because the goal is the very highest anything below that has an element of selfishness and then he says namasyantascha mam bhaktya with devotion you are prostrating before me whenever there is an action performed and the fruits thereof invariably brings about an element of arrogance and ego so bhakti is injected into the action so that you develop an attitude of humbleness humility to arrest the ego that arises out of the work that you perform so karma is always club with bhakti so in this verse there is a mention of karma and bhakti so prostrating is only a means to humble yourself otherwise the arrogance destroys us so bhakti is an attitude of how do you understand bhakti what is bhakti or devotion the purpose i have said the devotion is meant to counter the ahankar or arrogance which comes from action it's just a counter measure but is bhakti a mere ritual is bhakti lighting an incense stick or offering a flower or of a fruit or lighting a lamp is that all bhakti is or is la bhakti taking a pilgrimage or is it performing a ritual in fact those are the outer skeletons of bhakti but the inner spirit of bhakti is way beyond the mere shell there the outer shell the real what is real bhakti in fact when one who has bhakti it's an it's an, an antidote for darkness like light is bhakti is an antidote for arrogance and ego but, but by merely performing a ritual i don't think it's going to offset the hankara or the ego so therefore we must be very certain what is this bhakti so what is this bhakti or devotion bhakti is ushama is saying it is surrender yes it is surrender what else is bhakti bhakti is actually what precedes gratitude a worshipful attitude again i think worshipful attitude and being an attitude of gratitude both are one and the same but what precedes being grateful hmm an acknowledgement of what providence has provided 
content yes but that attitude of contentment or gratitude comes in if you take a check or stock of what life has provided me with when i am when i take a stock and realize providence has provided me so much i am but indebted and grateful and i don't know in what way to thank the lord for what i have been blessed with so doing puja to the lord the other day i sent a, i was in a conversation with one of the students and she was asking me a question what is this bhakti and i was explaining to her in the course of my explanation i don't know whether she is here today but in the course of my explanation to her i said ma it's like i come to your house on your birthday invited i come to your house on your birthday i took a i take a a display piece from your showcase and gift it to you it's a happy birthday to you wouldn't it jar you what is this man doing and you come to my birthday and the least you can do is i am not expecting anything from you at least you give me a wish and that's what i want i just want it in your company but you come to my house take a piece a show piece from my shelf and give it to me and say as if it's a gift to me it's absurd exactly the same way i take a flower and a fruit or a offering from the lord's creation offer back to the lord what audacity what greatness is that i'm giving back in the in the aarti we chant no tera tujhko arpan kya lage mera om jay jagadish hare kya la- nothing is mine so what sense does it make for me to do a long puja or a short prayer i am only offering that which belongs to you so what am i in this there's nothing mine there's nothing that i can offer of mine everything belongs to you that kind of uh, and she said after that my god it really hit me sir guruji what you said it hit me so hard that you take a gift from my house and give it back to me so what am i doing to the lord there's nothing so you are, you are totally you realize you are helpless you are nothing insignificance so you understand that so when you play the role of bhakti you become insignificant in the totality vis a vis when you perform action the hankar or the i comes into the forefront and takes a precedence of everything i am the it could be so i am the speaker i am the guru i am giving knowledge so there could be very much possible that that ego or arrogance creeps in so how to arrest it is through bhakti so bhakti essentially has two elements one is awareness of what providence has provided how enriched am i with what life has blessed me with being aware take a stock a clear stock what all i have with me and having had taken a stock you have an attitude of gratitude because you can never ever settle or be grateful for all what you have and you can never say i have settled my scores with all i have been provided with you can never how can i so these two counter the hankar or the ego that arises from karma therefore he says always glorifying me firm in vows prostrating before me with devotion ever steadfast nitya yuktah and i was we have mentioned this any action or a thought has a potency only if it's consistent other day i was watching a a, a documentary i think that somewhere up where i don't know where is it the the they bore a tunnel uh the huh no no in india in india they bore a tunnel it's got the 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 Guinness Book of Records for, I think it's called Atal Atal Tunnel. On Atal Bihari Watch Pai, 
Atal Tunnel. It's the highest tunnel in the world, above 10,000 feet. Manali, yeah? Somewhere near Manali or? Ladakh, Ladakh. And, and the sheer terrain makes it almost impossible. And it it's almost snows eight months in a year and it's such a difficult terrain. And how it was such a uh, prestigious product and how they had to bore a tunnel right through the, the core of the mountain. And NAS program was just eye-opener. And all that they did was they ne never gave up boring. Amazing challenges, various challenges. And the first time ever in the world, anybody is boring at that height. And how they had to bore through it. And the tunnel is nine kilometers. It's not a joke. It's the longest ever tunnel at that height in the world. What? So they said, what got them through is we never gave up. That quality of just keep pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. So that, kept, that quality is a quality of a seeker is to be steadfast. Do I have that quality in me to keep my actions going? That takes me towards my goal. Today I'm inspired. This moment I'm inspired. But what happens the next moment? What happens tomorrow morning? What happens the day after? Am I have that capacity to keep going? That's the trademark of a, a true seeker, true aspirant. That's what brings about success, he says. And throughout the text, he keeps reminding us the importance of being steadfast, consistent. Correct. Even here, same. Even here, same. Even in this one, I'm referring to our Atal Tunnel. They bored from two sides, but the north side, they bored 80%. The south side, they only bored 20% because south side gets eight months covered with snow. So they couldn't bore. So they only bored the four months in a year. The other eight months, they bored. So they covered 80%. They met at a point. So it is, it's the same technology, but it's being done at that Undersea. Even the Euro Tunnel is the same thing. Isn't it? The Euro Tunnel also. Hmm? The Euro Channel. Uh, English, English Channel. English Channel. So, that's right. So, 14 talk about karma and bhakti. Now, the how karma and bhakti work is, it's like oil and saw. You need a saw to cut through a solid steel. But the mere saw if you continue to apply force, it would become brittle with sheer heat. So you need to add the lubricating agent. So the lubricating agent is the oil. It just calms things down. It settles it down and you can continue to cut through steel. It's easier. So you need the sharpness of the action karma with the softness of the devotion oil. And the next verse, it talks about intellect. Jnanam. So what we learn and understand is that you need all the three elements. You need karma, bhakti and jnanam. What is karma? Action. Bhakti is devotion and jnanam is knowledge. And the three parts are given because good to see you Ashrama. Namaskar. There are two Ashas. Ash, okay. Asha Bajaj and Ashama. Asha Bajaj yeah. is, is like me seeing myself in the mirror. <laughs> but Ashama is, uh, we met her in the, uh, where was that? Pune, Hyderabad. Hyderabad uh, retreat. Correct. We met, I don't know whether you remember me. I remember. I do, I do. Of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Ashama was from Pune and she was one of the participants in the Lalit Kapoor's uh, workshop, you know, good to see you. So I hope you're you. following the concept here. So yes. Ashama, the 14th and 15th verses are talking about how you use your physical body, your mind and intellect as tools for your own self-transformation. 
so when you use your body to attune to the self mm-hmm. or unite to the self it is known as karma yoga when i use my body to get to the self is known as bhakti yoga when i use my intellect to get to the self is known as gnana yoga the three parts because there are three equipments so these are the three primary avenues for our self transformation and more so what is important whenever we talk of this is is the proportion now whenever gayatri ma comes to the institute in the morning gayatri ma where do you see me gayatri ma in the institute whenever you come study room uh, show yourself also can't you show yourself ah gayatri ma so where do you see me study room most of the time in the study room where the corner one place study on the study table at the study table in the study room and i have how many times i have requested gayatri ma to sit at the other study table there many times how many times have you sat there not even once how um, how long has it ba- passed by 6 seven, seven months 6 7 months i have been telling her to sit comfortably we have created other study table for her please sit every day she sees me sitting there today also where you saw me there at the study study table. Room, study table now i understand thanks ma now you can unmute yourself and switch off your camera also ha huh? unmute mute and uh, 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 switch off your camera also she want to switch she wants to be incognito now i understand her so devoted she is she is serving right now she could be sitting in the hall amongst you all but she is doing managing so that you all we all have a seamless experience of uh, this audio even though we have our hiccups we are working around it but she is doing her best full of seva that bhavana to to serve the cause now why is she what she is is because of her constitution her constitution is predominantly karma there is bhakti there is gnana there is a proportion give me a chance i'll be sitting behind a desk give me a chance i may be seeing something which i have read 100 times 1000 times i am reading that same thing that is my proportion now i can't be her she can't be you you can't be me i comfortably sit 10 hours in a day behind desk with the books 10 hours minimum starts for am till evening whenever i get a chance i'll be sitting with it therefore it is not only the question of performing the three yogas it is a question of being true to your proportion so if you don't do or adapt to your proportion you will not grow so if my proportion is i'm 60% intellectual i'm 20% or 10% devotional 30% karma if that's my constitution i'm just saying for arbitrary sake and if i do 60% bhakti and 10% karma another proportion i do gnanam lopsided so not only to understand that there are three parts you must also understand what is my constitution what is my proportion that's important and this is not taught in is not informed nobody knows the teachers themselves don't know so it is not taught to a student that you need to calibrate it as per your specific proportion so you need to analyze yourself how much of a thinker am i how much of a feeler am i how much of an actor am i actor feeler thinker aft because you're constantly acting feeling thinking throughout the day don't you the moment you wake up all these three the body mind intellect wake up no but it's possible i agree with you that sometime long later on the intellect will wake up the intellect may wake up much later after i get up so with who with reference to who are you saying that sir ah that's okay 
I am happy to hear that clause. It's possible. It's a, the moment you wake up, is your body, mind, intellect is interacting with the world. So you're constantly acting, feeling, thinking. So when you're acting, feeling, thinking, you should know to how much I act, what's how much I feel, how much I think. Isn't it necessary for you to know? If you're on the spiritual path, you must know. So that you calibrate these parts as per your requirement. And there is efficiency and productivity only when there is calibration. As an engineer, you'll understand this. All machinery has to be calibrated, isn't it, sir? To make them optimum. So it is when you may be putting in effort without the calibration, the results are not optimum. So it's a such a specialized path, such a finesse is required. It's like sometimes when the engine is making RPM is high, he'll just take a screwdriver and do little one screwdriver, he'll just turn a little bit, automatically RPM will come down. The whole performance of the engine is based on a half a turn by with the screwdriver. That's all that's fine tuning. <laughs> Spiritual calibration. We should say, we'll come up with a concept topic called spiritual calibration. Sanjay, you're lost, Sanjay. All okay? Do you understand? Yes. And <laughs> the need to... So do you know your constitution? I have a self-image of my constitution. Um, I suppose, Guruji, my only question is, though we may have a bias to one or two of these or three, should, does that, is it important to have all three? So even if we're leaning more towards one or two, is it still important to retain that if, if um, my bias is towards Nanam, should I still try and be vigilant to develop bhakti or karma with a view that these are lower and I need to increase them? Or do I just carry on, or, you know, kind of pushing down them? That's, uh... Every human is a constitution, essential constitution of all three. <clears throat> okay. Every human being. Since you have got a body, mind and intellect, you have a certain composition of all three, three factors in you. They define you. So to the extent you are constituted and proportioned, you must do justice to that requirement. Like I would feel out of place if I don't pick up this literature and study even for a day. I'll just feel out of place. 20 years you've seen me. Have you ever seen without studying Vijaya? You've never seen me 20 years. Not a day where I've not opened a book and studied. I feel uncomfortable. I don't know when I last got into my own the puja room in my own house. I can't remember when I've gone into the puja room in, our, in my own house. Forget a temple. Now, I don't know what is your yardstick of being spiritual. I may be completely non-spiritual with reference to going to a puja room or offering a prayer or lighting an incense stick or performing a ritual. I can't remember when I've gone to my own house puja room. Yet, there's not a day I have not bathed in this literature. I have not soaked in this wisdom. I'm helpless. Don't look at me like that. I'm helpless. This is me. I'm, I'm not being shy nor I don't feel anything wrong in being who I am. I'm, I'm just an intellectual. No, no, it's not separate category. I'm saying it, it is an element of bhakti. Predominantly a person who is emotional, you can't put an emotional person into intellectual study, reflection, contemplation and all. It's, it's a different ball game.
Are you are you asking or telling me? Ah, oh, okay. I am not saying, sir. You can uh, let me be clarif clarifying. You can be a preliminary karma yogi or an advanced karma yogi, right? You can be in a preliminary bhakta or a very high advanced level of a bhakta. You can be a preliminary jnani or very advanced level of a jnani. The, the point what I'm driving home is, when I've taken an example of my personality, I'm saying I'm a predominantly an intellectual mindset. I am not inclined towards that much towards bhakti. There could be a person who is far more spiritually evolved than me, but he's a bhakta. That doesn't make me any greater or hurry any less. But the fact that it's a different path, you must know what is that path and am I designed, am I cut out for that path? So the fact that you come here is because there is that proportion of knowledge in you, without which you will not come back. The fact that you are rationalizing what I'm saying is jnanam is there. The fact that you all are lending your ears, jnanam is there. But to what proportion is it, you must find out. That's all I'm saying. But each path, in fact, in the Shastras, they have given examples of, just a minute, sir, of, just a minute. They are given examples of classic people who had one particular thing so pronounced, like you take example of Mirabai. Bhakta, Bhakta Kanabha, Bhakta Ramdas, or the great Tyagaraja, hmm? all these great people, sorry ma, Surdas, Kabirji, they all through devotion and bhakti, they may not be able to sit and rationalize all this. You give a, an Upanishad to a Tyagaraja, he may not uh, be able to decode the intricacies of it, but he is a realized soul. Does it make him any less? We are saying there are three different paths. Each path can take you right up to self-realization. But those Sanjay, those people are exceptions where their one aspect of their personality was so pronounced that predominantly 90% was bhakti or 90% jnanam. In fact, there was one great soul who had all three Adi Shankaracharya. There was none a man other than Adi Shankaracharya who had Profound knowledge, astounding bhakti, unparalleled karma. A man who established Advaita philosophy, the founder of Advaita philosophy, went the length and breadth of India in foot and bullock cart 14 times and he died at the age of 31, 32. Huh? 32 he died and in that young age, he took the length and breadth by foot and bullock cart, propagating Advaita philosophy he propounded. What is that? Karma. And he wrote such wonderful stotras. Bhajugovindam is one such, such beautiful lyrics which your heart melts. Other day somebody came and said, Sir, I have attended your Bhajugovindam, I attended Upanishad class, I attended Gita class of yours, but I must say, nothing comes close to Bhajugovindam, sir. Very sorry to say so. I said that you have connected with it. Now, who am I to say no to it? He felt so much. He said, I even my heart melts now when I go back and I keep falling back on those recordings. I keep listening to them. Such a simple yet profound text. So much bhakti Adi Shankaracharya had, so much karma he did. He is the propounder of Advaita school. Such are rare souls. So we should not make the mistake. The mistake the followers make is they mock their gurus. Whoever, whoever is your guru, whoever you are inspired by spiritually, you try to emulate them and try to do what they do. Never do what a guru does. A guru is doing what is true to his nature. You do it. I may be doing wrong to myself. 
So Sanjay, all the three natures, all the three personalities have to be catered to, have to be met to bring about an optimal result, a true transformation, a quick transformation. Otherwise, effort is being put in. I'm going nowhere. The results are not as favorable. Even though the scriptures talk of the yogas, they don't talk of the proportion. Yes, sir. Sorry, you are you okay, Sanjay? Right. You are saying something, sir? I agree with you. However, so uh, rest of the day, the time, I can't find myself without doing yoga, without doing exercise, without playing a sport, without doing some kind of physical activity. I'm attending to the administrative chores, looking into the operations, meeting people, running around, lecturing, all that is karma. I'm not sitting at a desk. When I'm sitting at a desk, I'm introverted. When I'm on the move, I'm extroverted. Extroversion is karma. Introversion is jnanam. And bhakti is sort of integrated. You can say, I, I, I do it with great devotion and love to what I'm doing. So bhakti runs parallel with Jnanam, but karma, I can't, I can't do administrative work sitting at my desk. I can't meet people. I can't go and lecture all over sitting at my place. I can't come here and lecture. The, what I'm doing is karma. Because physically I have to move from place to other to come and lecture. This karma going on. So that's the, even though they all seem to be so close and running parallel, as you say, but if we try to hair split them, they have a distinct expression it is. Bhakti is when I don't rationalize. When I was listening to a bhajan or a music, I am not rationalizing. I can sit here and give the importance of Ramayana, but when I sing a Rama bhajan, I am not rationalizing Rama. There I only feel for Rama. Here I am decoding what Ramayana means, who Rama is, what Sita is, what is the union between Rama and Sita mean, what was the separation mean, who is Hanumanji in that role of reunion of Lord Rama and Sita. All that I will, it's intellectualization. But when I'm singing a Rama Bhakta, there is no intellection, it's only devotion. My heart melts. Here my intellect scrutinizes. It's a different role altogether. But you may see it all as integrated because my whole body, mind, intellect is participating in that action. So I'm only trying to uh, clarify that it is a very specialized thing. Beyond a point, I can't sit in the bhajan's class. Beyond a point, I can't sit in a concert. I'm saturated. My needs are met. You can't tell me sit for three hours in a concert. I'll go mad. You can bring the best of musicians. But I'm just saying a, a figure, two hours, three hours, one hour, whatever it is. But I have a certain limit of my requirement. It's like, I offer you food. How much you eat is your capacity, a threshold. Beyond a point, you say, no, thank you. Whose threshold has to be taken as a standard? Personal, my capacity is my standard. Whom am I to follow? What is my capacity? So there's nothing right and wrong in the spiritual path. Please understand this. Your proportion is the right path for your growth. So it is therefore paramount. You know what your proportion is. 
don't mock others don't imitate others don't try to follow what others are doing identify with your own requirement your swadharma that is swadharma each one sorry we can if if you expect then we are in trouble if i expect something from you i have to blame myself i should not blame setu ji for that if you expect something from me you have to blame yourself not me because i am not assessing what setu ji is you are not assessing me what i am isn't it so the problem of relationship when we say is am i trying to understand and adapt to what the world presents correct ah vasantham vap when you are relating with the world the onus is on you to assess who am i dealing with what is his nature what is his personality what he brings to the forefront so that i can relate to him better than me sitting and saying or expecting him to be something which i have so it's never i project my personality onto you is rather me taking a stock of what you're projecting onto me you are helplessly projecting isn't it i should know what you're projecting than me projecting my expectations onto you and if i have that clarity of am i taking a stock of what's projected or am i projecting relationship becomes a, a smooth sailing this concept can go a long way in any corporate training so that your team understands each other's strengths and weaknesses and you're able to take everybody along in the journey but you have to take everybody along each everyone is a sailor in the journey and they are there rightfully so for a reason and they have a role to play but are they doing that role well and if are all players or playing various roles do they understand the limitations of others roles and are they playing their roles well matters otherwise each one is shooting each other when they take off the 100 fellows by the time they reach only captain is left everybody has shot each other you reach the show but with no passengers quibbling and quarreling at each other that can't go on so 14 talk about karma and bhakti and 15 he talk about jnanam ज्ञानयाप्यजो मुसते एक पृथक् बहुधा विश्व मुखम ज्ञानयाप्यजो मुसते एक पृथक् बहुधा विश्व तो मुखम अदर्स अदर्स रेफरिंग टू द अदर टाइप ऑफ कैटेगरी व्हिच आई स्पोक अबाउट द प्रीवियस इज कर्म एंड भक्ति हियर टॉक्स ऑफ अदर क्लास द ज्ञानम थ्रू द ज्ञान थ्रू द यज्ञ द सैक्रिफाइस ऑफ नॉलेज ज्ञान यज्ञेन दैट्स व्हाई वी कॉल दिस एज गीता ज्ञान यज्ञ गोइंग ऑन द ज्ञान यज्ञ ऑफ द हाईएस्ट नॉलेज नॉलेज ऑफ द गीता the yagna sacrifice of knowledge worship me as one upasate ekatvena ekam ekam means one worshiping me as one now that is the result the quality control of performing jnana yagna is that Am I doing correct? Jnana yagna. How many? How many? Tell me, Monio. One atvena. Only one na. Anna. 
What do you mean ekatvena? The result of jnanam is ekatvena. I'll explain. So, sacrificing of knowledge, worship me as one, as distinct, as manifold, all directions. Hmm. Bahudha Vishwato Mukham. What that last second half of the verse means is one who recognizes Ekam in the manifold facing all directions. You are able to see a unity in the diversity. Manifold means multitude, Nama Rupa, names and forms. So you are able to see the Ekam in the Nama Rupa. You are able to see the one in the manifold expressions you see the eternal in the ephemeral in fact On Panamodima. So the benefit of having jnanam is to be able to see a unity in diversity. You see the self in all beings. Is it on? Oh. So true, I'll, I'll tell you what the true jnanam is. But here, the verse is talking about jnana yoga. And he says jnana yoga Who is Anish? Yes, Anish ji. Okay. So, he is asking, how does one appear as many? No, no, it's not one appearing as many. You perceive the one in the many. In the many, in the manifold, just like you see one electricity manifesting in many gadgets. In all the gadgets, in all the expressions, you see one electricity. The electricity is one. The expressions are manifold. In that sense, he says, Ekatvena, Prathaktvena, Bahudha, Vishwatho, Mukham. This means wherever you perceive whatever you see, you only see the, the self. So the, the true quality of jnanam you have is you identify with the what is common between you and me. You identify. So when I, when I see you, I can identify with all the unequal factors. What's not common in both of us? What's not common? So many things are not common. In fact, there are more uncommon things than common. Shivaji has a personality of his own. He has got a body, a unique pattern of feelings, a unique pattern of thoughts, unique vasanas, a unique individuality, a different embodiment. So I only see him as different. So, but when I see him, am I seeing the, the many differences amongst us or am I seeing the one common factor between us? Okay, what are the common factors between us? 
what are the common factors between me and shivaji are when the when a questioner is being asked you can't ask the, the questioner can answer the question i'm asking about him you can't answer except shivaji everybody answers what's common between me and shivaji manifestation from saying god right sir something which i can relate to rajima what is the common factor between me and shivaji ha huh. anish ji is saying we exist but when we said hello to you you did not exist he didn't he didn't respond to us yeah yeah we both are existing we wish you also exist amongst us <laughs> yeah rajima sorry no we can't hear you there's some communication problem hmm see that i can see him as a the creature of god god created i can identify with him as another human being no or i can say we both are seekers of this wisdom some common factor we both are seeking the same truth or we speak the both lang same language we both stay in the same vicinity or we are belong to the same country or religion or we can say we both are human beings but all these are limitations but when i say i see myself in you and yourself in me when i see the self the common factor that is ekam but it doesn't limit you when i shift my attention to setu ji it's the same when i shift my attention to amma it's the same so i see in the manifold expressions around me when i see the self the same self is there in all things and beings around me that's the same but if shivaji himself is a problem then what that's a different problem if shivaji himself is a problem then we have to solve that problem very soon wait so what i wanted to give the the true definition of jnana the true definition of jnana is nitya anitya विवेक विचार वॉट इज दिस मीन नित्य मीन्स इच्छान नित्य कफीम विवेक in distinction and vicharam is contemplation this is true jnanam true jnanam is the distinction between to distinct between the eternal and the ephemeral and then you contemplate on it this is true jnanam and this is the purpose of any scriptural study it's not bookish knowledge it's not erudition it's not scholarship it's not scholastic information it's not how much you can parrot the books and literature how much you've mugged up not that this is the test this you hope you all all noted it sanjay noted it i think he wants it once more please नित्य आनित्य विवेक विचारम 
there you go again nitya is eternal anitya is ephemeral viveka is the intellectual discrimination and vicharam is contemplation between the terrestrial and transcendental and the only subject matter which talks about the transcendental is the scriptures every other worldly text talks about worldly matters only text that talks about brahman is this scriptures and if you study the scriptures and scriptures alone you are reminded of the transcendental that is when you can do vicharam every other knowledge is only of the world amazing so the 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 first half of the verse jnana yagnena he is talking of yagna now whenever you talk of yagna ma there are two aspects okay in any yagna what are the two aspects ma anish ji i can accept it no problem sir i just saw your message now it's fine so the the two aspects of a yagna a yagna has what is known as offering what you offer into the kund and what is kindled so two elements of any fire worship yagna or a fire worship is offering and kindling so what is offered in this gi jnana yagna what is offered anapurnama what is offered into this yagna fire hari om guru ji yes ma hari om uh, uh, maybe our ignorance uh, guru ji to gain perfect what is offered is ignorance what is kindled is knowledge knowledge so when you perform this jnana yagna what is kindled is this wisdom but what is destroyed or consumed is your ignorance is gone so what is the attitude of a person who is ignorant what is the perception of an ignorant person uh, not realizing that he is ignorant and i know all already see we just said a earlier a person who is knowledgeable the quality control is ekatvena prathakvena bahuda vishvato mukham he sees the one in the multitude an ignorant person sees as it is multi only the world he sees a multitude Good. in the ekam mm. he sees a difference in the oneness so the sign of ignorance is you see multitude of beings the sign of vidya is you see ekam that's all and wherever there is multitude what happens what comes about perfect answer anapurnama thank you when you see ram ji where there is difference what happens <laughs> a different line of thought i would say but when where there is oneness there is no there is no conflict when you see yourself in another person there is no conflict but when you see an otherness when there is separation what happens the so attachment is because you see a oneness 
what is attachment attachment is as you think so you become you attach to your car you become your car you attach to your family you become the family why you identified you become one with it that is becoming one but when you don't attach why because you dislike i hate you i am separating myself from you there are two different entities are formed because i have no identification with you correct ah huh? i am just using the same words you used but trying to clarify it where there is oneness there is no conflict there is no friction but the moment there is diversity where there is no knowledge you see diverse the diversity creates friction and conflict so in an organization there are conflicts and friction between people why why is there otherness in an organization they in a in in a corporate language there is no team spirit why is there no team spirit in organization why sir every anti karma yoga when i want to grow at the cost of others anti karma yoga but if i grow and you grow let's everybody grow together and i all, we all will grow only when the organization will grow sir i can grow as from a clerk to a manager to a senior manager and so on but when will i grow only when my the parent organization exists no if the chairman wants to grab for to fill his pockets if a manager wants to fill his pockets if a clerk wants to fill his take opportunities for his own self benefit where will the organization be there would be no banner to work under i am i it will be foolish for everybody to become a chairman of an organization i don't think everybody is aspiring to become a chairman in organization i don't think people are that foolish they are greedy i understand but they are not foolish i don't think in a, i have never worked in an organization but you tell me sir you have been a chairman you know everybody in organization is aspiring your post not necessarily they know they are not cut out for that but everybody wants a little bit more for themselves in that process i'm everybody is pulling the banner down how can the banner fly high if i am trying to pull down everybody is trying to pull it down but if each one tries to let it fly in that flame of the growth of the organization everybody is benefited that's what no when i offer so okay in the example of yagna we are taking example of yagna isn't it now he said in any yagna there are offerings and what is kindled now with reference to an organization what is to be offered vasantham back in an organization what is it that has to be offered now the the organization here is what the organization here what is yagna illa sir yagna what is yagna fire illa yagna is a fire worship when these two elements are going on the fire is going on the ritual is going on when all of us sit around the kund and offer the grains and ghee what's happening the flame is being shoot up the flame shoots up and blesses everybody in the the performance of the puja am i right so if the puja of the yagna the puja and fire is going on that means two these two are happening am i right now in the fire of the organization what is organization what is yagna in the organization
organization how healthy an organization is is the flame shooting up well the pujaris and the pandits ensure that there's a constant supply of fuel if there's a cut short the fire flame will die they don't want the flame to die in the whole period of the two hour ritual right now in the growth of the organization what is the offering the work ethics of whom oh everybody offers their guys sir their talents what else their work what else commitment to the work what is uh, sincere commitment team spirit, team spirit. Time. Sorry, sir? Time. time in fact what you sacrifice You sacrifice your ego and your selfishness. You have to offer that in the growth of the organization. And if each member, the entire team of the organization, does this, the offering, all everybody single, pointedly. Are working to bring reputation and growth to the organization. So when this is done, what is kindled? There is prosperity. There is progress. Another term. There is success. For whom? For the organization. For the team members when the organization grows the members of the organization are automatically benefited it can never be that the but when the only the members are benefited at the cost of the organization there is no organization have you not seen huge multinationals of collapsed why each one have non yagna spirit they worked now this is not being said in the 15th mantra i am only making it a applied philosophy out of it if you want to know the applied philosophy of the entire yagna we must read the fourth chapter of the gita ritu ji our next retreat we should plan for this one so whenever we plan for the next retreat we should do that in the fourth chapter he talks of 12 yagnas so there is the offering and the kindling what is what goes into it what comes out of it so the egos and selfishness are sacrificed to a cause what brings about is the individual is transformed the organization is transformed the organization is benefited the individuals are benefited so i purified myself because i am performing yagna i am indirectly benefited and directly indirectly benefited but if i work at the cost of the organization only i am benefited no sooner there will be no organization worth gone no organization why everybody has swallowed little bit of their i was just saw a small clipping of a video a uh, an electrician comes to a company madam uh, he finishes his job and he's leaving madam i am finished my job uh, i need to raise the bill whom do i raise the bill to ah you raise it to me how much is the bill acquainted fellow routine check up make repairs have come ah sir madam it's just 5000 rupees okay raise the bill for 10000 rupees madam only 5000 bill madam are i'll give you 1000 more here raise the bill for 10000 how comfortable she was to backstab the organization how comfortable she was abusing 
the privilege for your own self what would be the health of the organization sir if members of the organization have that anti yajna spirit what will be the health of the organization ram ji doldrums very soon time for bankruptcy bankruptcy completely shut down in fact in the the third or fourth chapter he says this world is not designed for the non sacrificers if you are a non if you are not a sacrificer if you are a non sacrificer this world is not designed for you you are unfit for it and he says this knowledge is only designed for non sacrificers means if you are a selfish fellow you are unfit for this knowledge quality control to enter in this satsang hall are you a sacrificer sir or gayatri mahar or or placard bodla are you a sacrificer then enter amazing and one who does this gnana yagna which is the worship of the knowledge which destroys ignorance the reflection the effect of that knowledge is you have a a totality perspective you see yourself one with others a simple example of perception of ignorance and knowledge web have you heard about the example we go about the prince and the mirror room no said you heard mirror room and the prince prince and the mirror room huh see there there was a prince as all palaces you know they used to have mirror room so the the prince used to enter that room before he presented himself in front of the the audience so and the mirror room's entire four walls the roof and the floor also is all decked up is all with fitted with mirrors so he he saw himself in every angle multitude of reflections but he saw himself well decked up well presented and he left and by mistake the door was left open apparently the the private pet of the prince entered that room and the moment the dog entered that room it saw multitude of dogs the moment it saw so many dogs it became very insecure it started barking and attacking and to its shock all the dogs at the same time barked and attacked it it got terrified sheer self defense it attacked more it was such a huge fight between all the dogs the dog was found in a pool of blood next day morning the same prince entered the same mirror room where the dog killed itself are we as foolish as the dog or as wise as the prince am i seeing myself in the world of plurality or am i seeing otherness in the world of plurality it's my perception it's not the world that's the sign of gnanam that's the sign of agnanam avidya so to see one in the manifold all directions you see there is manifold but there in, in that there is only one just as fire consumes wood in the fire concept the knowledge consumes ignorance okay again in fact in the 16th verse he actually talks about the yagna the fire worship ma just we'll just read through the 16 we'll read the translation i'll come and explain next week because he speaks about the yagna he says let's chant it aham kratura ham yagna 
स्वधाहमहमौषधम मंत्रोहमहमेवाज्यम अहमग्निरहम हुतम या इसे इस आयाम क्रतु द वेदिक रिचुअल आयाम द यज्ञ द सैक्रिफाइस आयाम श्राद्ध द एंसेस्ट्रल ऑफरिंग आवश्यक द मेडिसिनल हर्ब आयाम मंत्र द चैंट आयाम आज्य द क्लारिफाइड बटर आयाम अग्नि द फायर आयाम द हुता द बर्न्ड ऑफरिंग so every aspect of the ritual he says it's me it's me it's me everything is brahman so beautiful so what is offered is brahman what is kindled is brahman who is offering is brahman what is sought is brahman all arpanam is brahman everything is brahma arpanam all brahman okay okay we are finishing we are finishing அந்த ஒரு க்ளோசிங் டிங் 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 சொன்னீங்க நீங்க ஆ ஐ நோ ஐ நோ ஐ நோ ரைட் ஓம் ஓர் நமத ஓர் நமிதம் ஓர் நாத் ஓர் நமுதட்சதே ஓர் நஸ்ய ஓர் நமாதாய பூர்ணமேவாவசிஷ்யோ நம ஹரிஹியோ